Greetings once again, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Hardcore Truth, where we're bringing the light of truth into the darkness of compromise and apostasy of our day. Our goal is to find and to feed the hungry, to find and give drink to the thirsty. I know that there are many out there who are hunger, hunger and thirst for righteousness and for truth. So that's what we're about. That's why we're doing these video casts. Hardcore is an outreach ministry of Pathfinders Ministries that's led by myself, Bob Lubeck. Uh, again, if you're helped by these messages, please click on the subscribe button and then click on the notifications so that you can know when a new one comes out. And then tell other people about us. Today, we're in Lesson 4 of the teaching called The Closet of Friendship, Oneness, and Fellowship with the Lord. And this lesson is entitled Finding Victory. In our previous lesson, we tried to expose the problem uh, and, and we saw that only a personal revolution will change us. Not a reformation, a revolution. Not a corporate one, but a personal one. And of course, if there's enough people who are having a personal revolution, then it will become corporate. So let's get to the solution and find out what kind of revolution do we need. Let's begin by remembering what a priest is. Let's remember that Jesus died to save us so he could have us, so he could live his life in us, and through he, so he could live his life through us. Now, what is a priest? First and foremost, a priest is someone who separates the profane from the holy, someone who then represents God to man and man to God. Matthew 14, verse 16 says this, you're the light of the world. <laughs> Boy, that's a heavy burden to carry. Remember, Jesus first said that he was the light of the world, and then he turns around and says that you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And then he says, A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it underneath a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all in the house. Now Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the light-bearing priesthood of the New Testament believer is summed up in what is known the Great Commission. You see, we are to separate the profane from the holy, we're to represent God to man, and we're to represent man to God. This is really important. And so uh, th th this is what we were saved for. And so this light-bearing priesthood, it's all summed up in what, what we've come, become to know as the Great Commission, or in some people's lives, the Great Omission. <laughs> so let's look at it. For if we will revolutionize our understanding of it, we will be better able to enter the priesthood that Jesus Christ died to put us into. So let's begin with a literal amplified reading of this. Now, this is not something that I've taken lightly. A friend of mine is very knowledgeable in the Greek. And we discussed this deeply, and we went into all of the words, and we studied them. We even went back into ancient German theological textbooks to get a proper rendition of what the Greek was saying in the Great Commission. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a literal, amplified reading of this. And we're looking at Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus says, I have all the authority that there is in heaven and in earth. In that authority, I command you, as you are going, to cause people to be learners from me, about me, by a relational attachment to me. Immerse those who ha have you have caused to be learners from me and uh, about me by a relational attachment to me into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, 
Teach those who you have caused to be learners from me uh, by a relational attachment to me to guard like a soldier, to watch, to keep, to fulfill, and to hold fast everything I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even under all circumstances, even unto the end of the world. This, brothers and sisters, is our mission. It is our destiny and is directly connected why God formed us in our mother's womb. Let's talk about that for just a, a couple of minutes. The Bible tells us that we were formed in our mother's womb. Uh, so how, what does that mean? Does that mean that God uh, decided that I would have blue eyes, that I would be five foot eight, that, that I would uh, have uh, blonde hair? Well, it was blonde once. It's gray now. But, you know, all of our physical characteristics and our, our, uh, our emotional characteristics, does that mean that he formed all those in their mother's womb? Or did our DNA form those things? Well, who made the DNA? God made the DNA. So indirectly through the natural process of events, God forms us in our mother's wombs. But I think that scripture means far more than that. I think that there was a direct involvement of God while we were yet in our mother's wombs where he put in our spirit our destiny, why we are on this earth. He knew that you and I were going to become followers of Jesus Christ, and he put something in us, and it's our destiny, and that destiny is directly connected to our fulfillment of the priesthood of the believer through our involvement in the Great Commission. So through an abiding deep relationship with Jesus Christ, we learn from him by coming to him and prayerfully studying his word and then owning it. Notice that it, it, in the King James, it says observe. In the, in the NIV, it says obey. But you, you look up that Greek word uh, for, that's used to, for observe and obey, and it has nothing to do with obedience. It's very important. What, what I just read to you, it says that you, we, we are to guard like a soldier, to watch, to keep, to fulfill, and hold fast everything he's commanded us. That's what that Greek word means. It's a sense of ownership. This is mine. This is who I am. You're not going to take this away from me. Then, by being the light, we, we cause other people to do the same thing. We, we, we do not want to be self-deceived by just coming to Jesus and hearing and then not doing big problem in people's lives. Luke 6, 46 through 49. And why do you call me Lord, Lord? And don't do the things that I say. Whosoever cometh to me, heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man that built a house and he dig deep and he laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon the house, it couldn't be shaken for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doesn't do is like a man without a foundation built an house upon the earth and against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of the house was great. By abiding in Christ, by coming and hearing and doing, what happens is he takes it from our head to our hearts and he writes his law right in our heart and it becomes who we are. Big difference between trying to force yourself to not do stuff that you want to do uh, or to do stuff that you don't want to do than owning it and it being who you are. Hebrews 8.10 but this is the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them in their hearts and, and will be their God and they will be my people. This is the new covenant, people. This is the new covenant. We're living in the new covenant and God wants to write his law in our hearts, but that can happen by just reading the Bible and hearing the Bible. It's got to happen through a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's called prayer. 
But because of this poor understanding, the problems that I've talked about in the last lesson, uh, they exist and most never function in the priesthood that Jesus died for. But this problem isn't new. In fact, we see it in the Old Testament in the lives of the Levites and the sons of Aaron. Not all of them were functioning as priests. One reason for that was that anyone born with a birth defect or developed some blemish wasn't allowed to be in the priesthood, or excuse me, wasn't allowed to function in the priesthood. Let's see it. Leviticus 21, 16 through 24. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of the seed of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. A blind man, or a lame, or the he that has a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken footed, or broken handed, or crook backed, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. These people weren't allowed to function in the in the in the day-to-day -day functions of the priest. Now, how does this relate to us today? <laughs> there are many people who are born again. I'm not questioning where they're going to spend eternity. I'm quite sure that they're going to go to heaven. There are many that are born again. They have the birthright to be the priest who carry the seed of Christ, the word of God, in their hearts and to others. Yet something has gone horribly wrong in the womb, the spiritual womb, or in their spiritual birth, or in their spiritual lives. So many have been given a false gospel with self at the center. No cross, no repentance, no true faith, no real change, and no mission. And many more uh, seem to stumble through life, trying to obey, blemished with false guilt and unbelief and feeling rejected by God. These are POWs. They're hindered by all the brokenness of the past and with unbiblical concepts of who Father God is and therefore are dwarfed in their spiritual growth. And many a man has had his spiritual stones broken and is spiritually impotent because of not understanding his commander and chief in a relational way. So, where is this defection from truth? For years, let's talk about this Great Commission now. For years, people have seen the Great Commission as a command to disciple by baptizing and teaching. Do you understand what I just said? This is what most people think. We make, we disciple people by baptizing them and teaching them the word of God. But if you look closely and you uh, look at what I just read with that amplified thing, you look at this command. First of all, it's not the greatest command in Scripture, but it is the most authoritative command in Scripture. Can you think of any other command that is prefaced with such a statement as all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me, therefore. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I've got it all. I've got all. There is no other authority that could be possibly stronger than what Jesus is saying. I've got all of the authority that is in heaven and earth, and in that authority, this is what I'm telling you to do. That's the most authoritative command in Scripture. In fact, keeping the priesthood of the Great Commission is one of the ways in which, perhaps the greatest way, in which we love God with all that we are. We love Him with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole strength, our whole mind, and our neighbor is ourself. That's the greatest command. But because people see it as an option or as a corporate command rather than an individual command, most people either ignore the Great Commission or they explain it away. 
For instance, here's a way it gets explained away. The one who gives money in the plate to missions. That's a good thing to do. The one who takes the offering on Sunday or invites someone to church. They think that by doing that, they are part of answering the Great Commission. But that's wrong. These are good things to do. (laughs) You hear me? Those are good things to do. But they're not causing people to be disciples in a personal way. The Great Commission is something that must be answered by every man, every woman, every child in a personal way, not just in a corporate way or by proxy. The command is isn't to go that's not the command for many people for years have thought that that the great commission was about going somewhere but that's not the imperative of the great commission in the greek that is not an imperative in fact it could read read this way as you are going having gone the command The imperative is to personally be and personally cause others to be disciples of Christ. We don't disciple anyone. He does that. We connect them to him. If this command was not for every individual believer then there would be no need for the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us the boldness and the courage to be his martyrs, his witnesses. And in the Greek, baptizing, or better put, immersing, and teaching people to observe are subordinate clauses and dependent on and only really work for those who have already been made disciples. First, we spontaneously and personally cause a person to be a disciple of Christ by getting them to abide and to dwell in and to be with Christ in a in a prayer time, in a, in a time of seeking his face and studying his word. We do this because we're abiding and dwelling and knowing him ourselves. When you've got something so good that, 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 that Jesus is, and you have such a wonderful personal relationship with him, you want to share that with other people. Then we immerse them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, we're immersing them into God. We're immersing them into the Godhead because we have immersed ourselves. This is far more than dunking people in water. Now, let me clarify that. (laughs) I believe in water baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this is saying, baptize them, immerse them into the name of. It's talking about immersing people's lives into God, as well as the symbolic of uh, dunking them in water. Only then can we really teach people to observe from the heart out of an abiding, intimate relationship with God, only after we have caused them to be learners about Christ, from Christ, through a relational attachment to Christ, can we immerse their lives into the Godhead and teach them to own the commands of Christ. Therefore, we say, people say with this misunderstanding, we say, we're discipling some. I am discipling someone. Or we have a class that we in our church for discipleship. But you don't disciple anybody. You cause them to be disciples of Christ. Then he takes what's being taught and read from the head to the heart. He disciples them. <laughs> you see... I think you have seen, (laughs) you can baptize people, and they may not be disciples of Christ. Likewise, you can teach people forever in discipleship classes to obey, and they may not be disciples of Christ. A person can even be doing great and mighty works and not be a disciple of Christ. Matthew 7, 22 and 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord... 
Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. There's so much emphasis today on, do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Well, that's important. Do you know the Lord? But even equally or even more importantly, does he know you? That can only happen relationally as you pour your heart out to him and he pours his heart into you. Observing, again, means guarding and protecting. But it's got to flow from a faith abiding friendship oneness and fellowship with christ you see a disciple is a learner a learner not just someone who's studying you don't know something until you're doing it in god's eyes a disciple is a learner by a relational abiding attachment he's learning about christ from christ by this relational attachment. So, the question is, what will truly, diligently coming to him in faith and hearing him produce? Well, an observant, (laughs) keeping ownership that naturally flows from a faith-abiding friendship, oneness, and fellowship with Christ. Wow. I want that. God wants me to have that. I want you to have that. God wants you to have that. This is what a disciple is. He's a learner by this this faith-abiding friendship, oneness, and fellowship with Jesus Christ. Let's talk about these these words. Faith, abiding, friendship, oneness, fellowship for a minute. Faith. To really believe. So much so that you're willing to die. Now you've got something to live for. I often use this example uh, when teaching uh, about faith, about believing. Uh, Let's assume that I'm a a tightrope walker, and I'm very famous, and I travel all over the world and and walk the tightrope. And there's this individual who follows me everywhere I go. He's a groupie, a tightrope walker groupie. And he's seen all of my acts. He's seen me walk across the tallest buildings in New York. He's seen me walk across the, uh, the Niagara Falls. And now I've got my wire stretched across the Grand Canyon. And uh, I'm about ready to go. And part of my walk is that I push a wheelbarrow across this wire. And there's the groupie. He's sh- standing right there in front of all the crowd. And his name, let's call him Bill. And I, or Mary, let's call her Mary. (laughs) I say to Mary, Mary, do you believe that I can do this? And Mary says, absolutely, Bob, I believe you can do that. I've seen you do it many times. And so then I look at Mary and I say to her, get in the wheelbarrow, Mary. Quite a difference, isn't there? For Mary to believe that I can do something and then to put her life on the line for it. That's what that word faith means. That Greek word means to trust in, to adhere to, to rely on. It's not just I believe that it's true. The devil believes that way. The next word is abiding. It's the Greek word minnow and it means to uh, continue, to dwell, to endure, to stay. In Isaiah chapter 40, 31, many of you probably know this scripture. uh, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up of wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Well, that Hebrew word for wait is the New Testament equivalent of meno, and it means Uh, It doesn't mean waiting for somebody like I wait for my wife or you wait for someone or you wait for something to happen. That particular word wait means to bind together by twisting. It's that same meaning to continue, to dwell, to endure, to stay, to abide, to to, uh, be bound together by twisting. Now our word friendship. Jesus said that he was our friend if we do what he says. 
a friend. What a word. <laughs> a fr friend never leaves his friend behind. John 15, 14, it says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. A friend is a combat battle buddy that cares for you like his own life. He is someone who will lay down his life for you. He's someone you can trust with your life and respect, maybe even trust with your wife. <laughs> Many years ago, I was in my prayer closet, and I was talking with the Lord about something altogether differently than what he began to talk to me about. And I heard the Lord in my heart say to me, Bob, what do you want in a friend? And I started to tell him what I wanted in a friend. And he said, no, I want you to really think about this, spend some time on it. I want you to make a list. What do you want in a friend? And so I did. I probably spent a week on it. I don't remember how long, but I, I'm guessing about a week. And I made a long list, and then I shortened the list, and it was a short list of what I want in a friend. And then God said something profound to me, something that changed my life forever. He simply said, be that. Be that, Bob, and never, ever care whether you get it back or not. That changed my life forever, and I have done that ever since. I have totally uh, disown myself from ever caring whether anybody is my friend. All I want to do is be their friend with people who will do what God tells them to do. <laughs> Oneness. Jesus said we're one with him in the same way that he is one with the Father. One place he said that he loves us. He loves us the same. The Father loves us the same as he loves Christ. We're one body with Christ. We've got his mind. We have his spirit. We have his faith, his calling, his hope, his father, his power, his authority. The next word is fellowship. Quite similar, means to have things in common. What do we have in common with Christ? Everything that I just mentioned, plus a common purpose, a common mission, a common cross, a common suffering, a common voice, a common ministry, a common gospel, righteousness, death, and resurrection. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what more do we want? <laughs> what more do we need? But what we've got to see is that we can't walk in these things unless we are diligently abiding in him. Nor can two Christians have true Christian fellowship unless they're having fellowship with Christ. They, they can be Christians fellowshipping about a lot of things. The golf game, this, that, the fishing, the, the, the mall, the new dress, the wedding that's coming up. They can be Christians that are fellowshipping and having a common interest about a lot of things. But that's not Christian fellowship. That's Christians fellowshipping. <laughs> By the way, that's what most people do in church on Sunday morning. They are Christians fellowshipping, but they're not having Christian fellowship. In order to have Christian fellowship, you've got to have two people that have been fellowshipping with Christ and are sharing that with each other. It's unbelief and idolatry that keeps us at this, this, this modern-day church system that looks more like a petting zoo. It, a, a person who believes he can be intimate with Christ sees it as a privilege and is. A person who is abiding in Christ is growing out of unbelief, out of fear, out of worry, out of idolatry, and growing into the love and acceptance of God through an abiding relational heart knowledge, not head knowledge. There's a big difference. Difference is spoken of in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That word know is the Greek word gnosko, it is not the word gnosis. Gnosis is head knowledge. Epigenosis is a amplified knowledge. But gnosko is used 
by the Jews as an idiom for the act of marriage, it, it, where it says that Joseph did not know Mary until after Jesus was born. That's the word gnosko. And you shall gnosko the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus is the truth. So to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, the truth, that's what sets us free. But it's unbelief, fear, and idolatry that keep Christians yarding up like a bunch of scared does in the winter for what they call fellowship instead of people who are out. Not full of fear, running around, isolating ourselves from other people, staying 20 feet away instead of even not even 6 feet away, staying 20 feet away, masks, all masked up, hiding in our houses. We're supposed to be out among the fearful, calling them to be disciples of Christ. These people group up in little Bible studies and book studies and prayer groups and, and, and cell groups. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But... They should also be going and making disciples and teaching others. They should not just be studying things over and over and over again that they already know. But the problem is they don't know it at a heart level. What they have been studying for years, it hasn't moved from their heads to their hearts. I'm going to tell you, I learned this as a brand new believer. The first church that I was part of, committed to, was called Glad Tidings. And I was in a Sunday school class. It was a long time ago, back in the 70s. Brand new believer. And the pastor was teaching in the Sunday school hour. He had a pastor's class. It was tremendous. He was a tremendous man of God and a tremendous teacher of the Word of God. And he was teaching the Word of God. And and during his teaching, there was an individual, a, a woman, who raised her hand and asked a question. She was one of the older ladies in the church, been a Christian for years and years and years. She asked a question, and the pastor gave her an answer, very good answer. And then one of the deacons in the church, another older man who had been a Christian for many, many, many years, he gave a comment on that, and then the pastor went on with his lesson. I was impressed with that. The next day while I was working on the railroad, I was sharing what I had learned in that Sunday school class with them, whether they wanted to hear it or not. <laughs> a few months or so went by. Pastor's class, somehow that same topic came, came up. And he taught the same thing. And guess what happened? That same lady asked the same question. That same deacon raised his hand and, and gave his comment, same comment. And I'm sitting there, a new believer, and I'm thinking to myself, boy, there's something wrong with this. These people are just playing a game here called church. Years later, I... I learned this lesson again. Uh, there was a woman in the church that I was pastoring. And she was a woman who was always talking about the importance of wives submitting to their husbands. And she was wanting to teach this book and that book. And she had this group of women that she was always teaching, primarily about uh, women submitting to their husbands and things like that kind of a little house on the prairie uh, Christianity stuff that she was teaching as well. And so she asked if she could meet with me, and she came to my office, and, and she said that she wanted to teach this certain book, and would I approve the book? And I said to her, I said, I won't use her name, I'll call her Linda. Linda, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I'm okay with you teaching that book. I have never had any problem with the literature that you use. But I want to make a suggestion to you. I want you, instead of teaching that group of women, in that, in that group of women, you've got three other women who know this stuff as well as you do. What I would like you to do is I want you to team up with this lady, and I want those other two ladies to team up together and go out and start different, with a different group of people that don't know this stuff and teach it to them. Why, that's reasonable, isn't it? Why, she went ballistic. 
caused a big uproar and a big stir. Uh, my goodness, people left the church over this. Yeah. Studying stuff over and over and over again isn't what people who are true disciples of Christ do. Those people that I'm referring to, obviously, were not diligently seeking the face of God. They were attendees at a, a Christian social club called church and playing the game very well. Therefore, what happens is people become what Ralph Neighbor, Ralph Neighbor wrote a book uh, called um, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? And in Ralph Neighbor's book, he refers to this type of individual as navel-gazing clusters of impotent people Bible-studying themselves to death. What a statement! Navel-gazing clusters of impotent people Bible-studying themselves to death. They do this because they don't know the Lord the way that they should in a faith-abiding friendship, oneness, and fellowship through prayer. Instead, they're trying to live off someone else's walk with God, whether it be the preaching on Sunday or the latest book that they've read. This is the defect that hinders the priesthood, and this is what keeps people in bondage and prisoners of war and not a, because they're not abiding in him. So the choice we have before us is to learn to pray or to live off someone else's walk as a POW. Someone said to me not long ago, he said, my wife and I are going to leave the church we're in and go to a different church. And I, I said, why? He said, well, my wife, naturally as his wife, uh, my wife isn't being fed. And I said to him, I said, what do you mean your wife isn't being fed? I, you know what? Why isn't she feeding herself? Why aren't you feeding her? Well, uh, you know, people don't like to hear that kind of stuff. If people knew the Lord in a faith-abiding way, they would be free, and they would have his heart for the lost, and they would have his heart and be involved in the priesthood of the Great Commission. And what these people have got to see is that they're falling into delusion. Why? Because they don't have their senses exercised to discern delusion. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For when the time you ought to be teachers... Let me start again. For when the time you, you, you <laughs> ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belong to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, come here, do, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Are your senses being exercised? No, unless you're a doer of the word. Jesus had a deep faith abiding friendship, oneness, fellowship with his father through prayer. He was able to do what he saw the father doing. He not only displayed the right behaviors, he displayed the right heart attitudes that flowed from the love and mercy of his father. And as we go on in this class, we're going to see that the, the, the our father contains the heart attitudes of Jesus Christ that we need to be have built into our lives. I won't go into that now, but that's where we're going. God is concerned with the inside. <laughs> and our private behavior is way more important than our public behavior. Perhaps you've heard of the parking lot miracle. <laughs> Typical family on Sunday morning. They maybe slept in, the alarm didn't go off, and now they're up and everybody's in a hurry and mother is scurrying about here and trying to get the children ready and, and, and dad is uh, getting more and more irritated because they're not ready and he's starting to bark orders at the children and bark orders at his wife and now they're, 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 they're rushed into the car and they're driving to the church and they're, the kids in the back seat are bickering with one another and uh, Johnny hit me and Mary won't do this and he's teasing me and, and the dad is hollering, you kids 
settle down in the back seat and mom is hollering, you kids settle down, you want dad to have an accident and they're bickering at one another and the wife and the husband are bickering at one another. The wife is crying. They pull into the parking lot and all of a sudden everything changes. Oh my, they become the most wonderful Christian family you've ever seen. More miracles like that happen in the parking lot than in the building. (laughs) Hypocrisy. The fear of man, not the fear of God. So then, what is a disciple of Christ? John 15, 4 through 8. Jesus says, abide in me. That's our word, meno. And I in you. Oh boy, you hear that? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except that abide in the mind. Fine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here and is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Jesus just defined what a disciple is. An abider. Someone whose life is flowing into the vine and the and the and the vine's life is flowing into them there's this exchange of life this intimate relationship Christ a disciple of Christ again I'll repeat is someone who's learning about Christ from Christ by an, a, re, a relational faith abiding friendship oneness and fellowship like a branch connected to a vine Someone who is abiding and being transformed in their heart and mind and observing from the heart through faith, life sharing. I think it's becoming quite obvious what the biggest problem in people's lives is today and where the defect is and why we need a personal revolution. We have baptized people. We have taught them to obey or that is just fine to disobey, but we have not caused them to be diligent disciples. Therefore, we have not restored the light-bearing priesthood of the believer and we have not produced true worshipers of the Lord. Matthew 15, 8. As people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, But their heart is far from me. Most are quite willing to go to church and be attendees and spectators, POWs in the soft bigotry of low expectations. Others are withering and drying up and trying to obey with their head knowledge, but without an abiding in him. Also, many are withering up They're being gathered by men as part of the falling away and are getting burned by this hyper-grace gospel, false gospel lie. Jude 4, for there are crept in, there are certain men crept in, unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, that means loose living and denying the only Lord, our God, Jesus Christ. So in order to not be POWs, we must be diligently seeking the face of God every day in an undisturbed place. Hebrews 11, 6, For without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first of all believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Seeking the face of God and having a life-sharing intimacy must flow from faith in the love and acceptance of Christ. We do not seek his face in prayer so that he will accept us. We seek his face in prayer because he has accepted us. One is legalism, the other is faith. You see, we cannot and will not abide if we feel forced to. 
Unbelief and law are death. Faith is life. But most people don't come. So they're slowly withering away as POWs. They say, let's get together sometime to Christ, but they never do. Christ gave us the example and taught us how. He rose up early. He went off alone to be with his fathers. He didn't just talk and commune with the Father as he went about his business during the day. He saw his need for an intentional, undisturbed, secret time alone with the Father where there was no distractions. Then he taught us to do the same thing. There are many teachings on prayer, but I think his is the best. How about you? Matthew 6, 6, Jesus says, But thou, <laughs> when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward you openly. Let me just pause there for a minute. How does God reward us? A new car, a new job, a new girlfriend, a new boyfriend, a better marriage. Yeah, maybe. But that's not his focus. God rewards us by conforming us into the image of Christ. And God is saying to us, you go and get in a closet. Get in an uninterrupted place of quiet and talk to the Father. And he, he, he didn't say have prayer meetings. <laughs> prayer meetings are good. Again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with prayer meetings. <laughs> Actually, they're hypocritical if we're not doing what Jesus just told us to do first and foremost. We should have prayer meetings. But first and foremost, we should do what Jesus said. Get in that closet alone and seek his face diligently. Prayer meetings don't substitute for the teaching of Christ. Faith-inspired, diligent, determined, abiding prayer is the way we tap into God's vision and strength to our walk and destiny. Let me back up a minute and talk about prayer meetings again. I just remember the, the first uh, the, the prayer meeting that was had when <laughs> Peter was arrested and thrown in jail and uh, all the saints were gathered over at John Mark's house there and they were praying diligent, no, no, no doubt praying for Peter. And then Peter comes and he he knocks on the on the gate, and Rhoda comes out and answers and and she she sees that it's Peter. And instead of opening the gate, she runs into the house and she tells everybody that's in the house praying for Peter. Hey, Peter's right out there. He's standing at the gate, and they don't believe her. <laughs> what kind of prayer meeting was that? Faith-inspired, diligent, dependent, determined, abiding prayer is the way we get God's vision for our lives. It was where we see what God is doing and we become a part of what God is doing instead of trying to get him to do what we want him to do and we walk out our destiny. We've got to learn that real prayer is the backbone of the Christian walk, not just something that we do. When we do, we will be abiding and we will begin to become more and more like him as priests and worshipers. His life attitudes will become our life attitudes, little by little. So often we run ahead of God or we lag behind God for his vision for our lives and ministries. But if we will seek his faith through faith-inspired, diligent, abiding prayer, we can be in tune with him. You see, you become like the people that you hang around with, good or bad. 1 Corinthians 15.33, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Well, the opposite has to be true. <laughs> Good company builds good character. Try being with Jesus and the Father every day and see what happens to your attitudes. 
He will reward you openly by building good character, good attitudes, by helping you develop the heart attitudes of Jesus Christ. You see, there will be huge physical, emotional blocks in our lives, and we will need the power of the Holy Spirit to break them and heal us. We must remove the unbelief from our lives and cry out for more of the Holy Spirit. Then we will grow. Our growth will speed up, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Why would we not confess our unbelief and cry out to God to fill us and begin to look for and expect the power of God to work in us and through us? And when we have drawn near to him, like he draws near to us, as we draw near, he draws near. We make the first step. We draw nigh to God. He draws nigh to us. And then we we go about our our day. And we, we hold on to this oneness with him. However, most never come to the place of developing the attitudes of Christ and enter the light-bearing priesthood of the believer through the Great Commission. Why? Because they never desperately become diligent, dependent, determined, disciplined, daily, intentional disciples of Christ. Instead, they're casual. That, that verse, Hebrews eleven six 6, doesn't say he's a rewarder of those who casually seek him. It says diligent. So people are casual. They're inconsistent. They're irresponsible. They're indolent in their relationship with God. Remember, he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, not those who casually seek him. The word indolent means, oh, I like that word. <laughs> Let me tell you how I came upon that word. Many years ago, I was reading a book. I can't remember which explorer it was. It was one of the Arctic explorers. I can't remember who it was. But he was out of food, water, holed up in his tent in a huge storm. The wind was raging, a blizzard outside. He couldn't go out there because if you've ever been in a blizzard like that, I have up in the Arctic myself. Why, you don't go outside because you're going to get lost in a real big hurry. You don't know where you are. and Take two steps away from the house and now you don't know where the house is anymore. So he was in his tent. His stores, unbeknownst to him, were only a little ways away. But he was in his tent and he was dying. And he was writing things to his wife. And the last thing that he wrote to his wife before he died was guard our son from indolence. And I thought, wow, that must really be important. And I didn't really know for sure what that word meant, so I looked it up. Slow to heal, slow to change, desiring little or no pain. Is that not a picture of so many today. What a shame. We have the door of the Holy of Holies open for us and we're irresponsible, inconsistent, and indolent instead of being intentional. Oh, we we come to church. But why? (laughs) For the most part, to be a spectator, like at a movie or a sports event we we come we find our seat we watch we're touched and then we go and we we give a critique of the event i saw this uh on two occasions at least in my life uh the first was in mexico i was asked to preach at a at a very large church in in mexico and they had two services on sunday morning and the minute i was asked they asked me if i would do both services I something didn't sit right with me. This is the first time I was ever asked to do this. Something didn't sit right. And I thought to myself, I, I can't do that. I can't preach that sermon twice. Like that's like an act. And so I preached two sermons, uh, different sermons at the two different services. Another time I was at a big church and I uh, was ministering there and they had two services as well. And I watched this thing. The people came in, 
They, they met their friends, gravitated to their friends, ignored everybody else, gravitated to their friends and, and talked about the week. They talked about this and they talked about that. No Christian fellowship here now. Just talking about, uh, well, there's my daughter's getting married and I, my job is, a, yeah, and uh, test moaning, a lot of it. And then they, they, uh, the service was to begin, and so they went in, found a place to sit, no doubt the same place they sit every Sunday, and then the event began. And the event went on, and it did what the event does. You know, you've been there. You know what the service is all about. And then it ended, and what did they do? They all filed out and grouped up with their clicked up with their friends that they felt comfortable with again, and they shared whether, the, well, that was a good man, that was a bad, I wish we'd sing more of this. With. And, and, and then they all left. And then a very short time later, the new group filed in. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this, and I, I, I put my head in my hands and I said, my God, Lord, this is what people do at a movie, a movie theater. These are just spectators. This is not what God wants. <laughs> He doesn't want event spectators who have just added Jesus to their lives, whose prayers are about all the cares of the world. He wants participants in the priesthood of the Great Commission who have him as their lives. And then everything else is added on. We've got this adding all upside down. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, Therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. We don't add Jesus to our life. He is our life. And then he adds what's important. Today, so many spectating, withering Christians are not flowing in the energy of the Holy Spirit and are not developing the attitudes of Christ. Therefore, they are not developing and they are not reproducing and they're bored, conquered, victim, spectator mentality people. What we have today is an absolute failure to launch. <laughs> The vast majority of Christians have at least at one time in their life sought God desperately to do something for them or in them. Very few have ever sought God in a desperate way to do something through them. In the book of 2 Kings, we have the story of Elijah being taken up in a whirlwind. <laughs> After he smote the waters of Jordan and they parted in front of his disciple, Elisha. His willing disciple, diligent, by the way, they, he tried to he put him to the test that day. They walked and they walked and they walked. And he said, you go, you could stay here. I'm going over there. Eh, no, no, Elisha said, no, no, I'm going wherever you go. <laughs> diligent disciple, Elisha was there and asked for a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah. Elijah was taken up and the mantle did fall on Elisha. Saints, this is a picture of the resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and a picture of that Christ told us that we would do greater works than he did. Have you ever diligently sought for the double portion? So after Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind, Elisha, Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind, Elisha took up his mantle, smote the waters, and he said something. 2 Kings 2, 12 through 14. And he took the mantle of Elijah and, that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. Many spectating, indolent, inconsistent, 
irresponsible. Add Jesus to your life, people. Today are in deep turmoil and they're crying out, where is the Lord God? They have received the mantle. However, the waters of their trial is not parting. Why? One reason is that Elisha did not want the waters to part so he could be comfortable or see another demonstration of power. He wanted the waters to part so he could demonstrate his call and anointing and cause others to believe he wasn't self-absorbed. Many today have become withering spectators who cry out, but the waters don't part and they're being washed away by the flood that beats vehemently upon their house. Why? Because they're not building their house on the rock of a faith abiding, intentional relationship with Jesus Christ called prayer. Heavenly Father, God, don't let these words fall on stony hard ground. Break up the fallow ground, Lord God. And call everyone that listens to this message to a diligent, daily, determined, desperate relationship with you. Lord, where they find a place that they call their prayer closet and they go in there and they seek your face, God, diligently, not for 10 minutes, but diligently, Lord God until they've broken through. I pray this, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.